The Bhagavad Gita, translated by Sir Edwin Arnold, Chapter Two. Sanjaya. Him filled with such compassion and such grief, with eyes tear dimmed, despondent, in stern words the driver Madhusudan thus addressed. Krishna. How hath this weakness taken thee? Whence springs the inglorious trouble, shameful to the brave, barring the path of virtue? Nay, Arjun, forbid thyself to feebleness. It mars thy warrior name. Cast off the coward fit. Wake, be thyself. Arise, scourge of thy foes. Arjuna. How can I, in the battle, shoot with shafts on Bhishma or on Drona? O thou chief, both worshipful, both honourable men. Better to live on baker's bread with those we love alive, than taste their blood in rich feasts spread, and guiltily survive. Ah, were it worse, who knows, to be victor or vanquished here, when those confront us angrily, whose death leaves living drear. In pity lost, by doubtings tossed, my thoughts distracted turn to thee, the guide I reverence most, that I may counsel learn. I know not what would heal the grief, burned into soul and sense, if I were earth's unchallenged chief, a god, and these gone thence. Sanjaya so spake Arjuna to the Lord of Hearts, and sighing, I will not fight, held silence then. To whom with tender smile, O Bharata, while the prince wept despairing, twixt those hosts, Krishna made answer in divinest verse. Krishna, thou grievest where no grief should be, thou speakest words lacking wisdom. For the wise in heart mourn not for those that live, nor those that die. Nor I, nor thou, nor any one of these ever was not, nor ever will not be, for ever and for ever afterwards. All that doth live, lives always. To man's frame, as there come infancy and youth and age, so come there raisings up and layings down, of other and of other life abodes, which the wise know and fear not. This that irks, thy sense-life thrilling to the elements, bringing thee heat and cold sorrows and joys, tis brief and mutable. Bear with it, prince, as the wise bear. The soul which is not moved, the soul that with a strong and constant calm takes sorrow and takes joy indifferently, lives in the life undying. That which is can never cease to be. That which is not will not exist. To see the truth of both is theirs who part essence from accident, substance from shadow. Indestructible learn thou the life is, spreading life through all. It cannot anywhere by any means be anywise diminished, stayed, or changed. But for these fleeting frames which it informs, with spirit deathless, endless, infinite, they perish. Let them perish, prince, and fight. He who shall say, Lo, I have slain a man. He who shall think, Lo, I am slain. Those both know not. Life cannot slay. Life is not slain. Never the spirit was born. The spirit shall cease to be never. Never was time it was not. End and beginning are dreams. Birthless and deathless and changeless remaineth the spirit for ever. Death hath not touched it at all, dead though the house of it seems. Who knoweth it exhaustless, self-sustained, immortal, indestructible? Shall such say, I have killed a man, or caused to kill? Nay, but as when one layeth his worn-out robes away, and taking new ones, saith, These will I wear to-day, so putteth by the spirit lightly its garb of flesh, 
and passeth to inherit a residence afresh. I say to thee, weapons reach not the life. Flame burns it not, waters cannot o'erwhelm, nor dry winds wither it. Impenetrable, unentered, unassailed, unharmed, untouched, immortal, all-arriving, stable, sure, invisible, ineffable, by word and thought uncompassed, ever all itself. Thus is the soul declared. How wilt thou then, knowing it so, grieve when thou shouldst not grieve? How, if thou hearest that the man new dead is, like the man new born, still living man, one same existent spirit, wilt thou weep? The end of birth is death. The end of death is birth. This is ordained. And mournest thou, chief of the stalwart arm, for what befalls, which could not otherwise befall? The birth of living things comes unperceived. The death comes unperceived. Between them beings perceive. What is there sorrowful herein, dear prince? Wonderful, wistful to contemplate, difficult, doubtful to speak upon, strange and great for tongue to relate, mystical hearing for every one. Nor wotteth man this, what a marvel it is, when seeing and saying and hearing are done. This life within all living things, my prince, hides beyond harm. Scorn thou to suffer, then, for that which cannot suffer. Do thy part, be mindful of thy name, and tremble not. Not better can be tied a martial soul than lawful war. Happy the warrior to whom comes joy of battle, comes as now, glorious and fair unsought, opening for him a gateway unto heaven. But if thou shunst this honourable field, a kshatriya, if knowing thy duty and thy task thou bidst duty and task go by, that shall be sin. And those to come shall speak thee infamy from age to age. But infamy is worse for men of noble blood to bear than death. The chiefs upon their battle chariots will deem twas fear that drove thee from the fray. Of those who held thee mighty souled, the scorn thou must abide, while all thine enemies will scatter bitter speech of thee to mock the valour which thou hadst. What fate could fall more grievously than this? Either, being killed, thou wilt win Swarga's safety, or, alive and victor, thou wilt reign an earthly king. Therefore arise, thou son of Kunti, Brace thine arm for conflict, nerve thy heart to meet, as things alike to thee, pleasure or pain, profit or ruin, victory or defeat. So minded, gird thee to the fight, for so thou shalt not sin. Thus far I speak to thee as from the Sankhya, unspiritually. Hear now the deeper teaching of the yoga which holding, understanding, thou shalt burst thy karma bond, the bondage of wrought deeds. Here shall no end be hindered, no hope marred, no loss be feared. Faith, yea, a little faith, shall save thee from the anguish of thy dread. Here, glory of the Kurus, shines one rule, one steadfast rule while shifting souls have laws many and hard. Specious but wrongful deem the speech of those ill-taught ones who extol the letter of their Vedas, saying, This is all we have or need. Being weak at heart with wants, seekers of heaven, which comes, they say, as fruit of good deeds done. Promising men much profit in new births for works of faith, in various rites abounding, following whereon large merit shall accrue towards wealth and power. Albeit, 
who wealth and power do most desire, least fixity of soul have such, least hold on heavenly meditation. Much these teach from Veds concerning the three qualities. But thou, be free of the three qualities, free of the pairs of opposites, and free from that sad righteousness which calculates. Self-ruled, Arjuna, simple, satisfied. Look, like as when a tank pours water forth to suit all needs, so do these Brahmins draw texts for all wants from tank of holy writ. But thou, want not, ask not, find full reward of doing right in right. Let right deeds be thy motive, not the fruit which comes from them. And live in action, labor, make thine acts thy piety, casting all self aside, contemning gain and merit, equable in good or evil. Equability is yog, is piety. Yet the right act is less, far less, than the right thinking mind. Seek refuge in thy soul. Have there thy heaven. Scorn them that follow virtue for her gifts. The mind of pure devotion, even here, casts equally aside good deeds and bad, passing above them. Unto pure devotion devote thyself. With perfect meditation comes perfect act, and the right-hearted rise more certainly because they seek no gain, forth from the bands of body, step by step, to highest seats of bliss. When thy firm soul hath shaken off those tangled oracles which ignorantly guide, then shall it soar to high neglect of what's denied or said this way or that in doctrinal writ. Troubled no longer by the priestly lore, safe shall it live and sure steadfastly bent on meditation. This is yoga and peace. Arjuna What is his mark who hath that steadfast heart confirmed in holy meditation? How know we his speech, Kasava? Sits he, moves he like other men? Krishna When one, O Pritha's son, Abandoning desires which shake the mind, finds in his soul full comfort for his soul. He hath attained the yog. That man is such. In sorrows not rejected, and in joys not overjoyed, dwelling outside the stress of passion, fear, and anger, fixed in calms of lofty contemplation. Such a one is Muni, is the sage, the true recluse. He, who to none and nowhere overbound by ties of flesh, takes evil things and good, neither desponding nor exulting, such bears wisdom's plainest mark. He who shall draw, as the wise tortoise draws its four feet safe under its shield, his five frail senses back under the spirit's buckler from the world which else assails them, such a one, my prince, hath wisdom's mark. Things that solicit sense hold off from the self-governed. Nay, it comes, the appetites of him who lives beyond depart, aroused no more. Yet may it chance, O son of Kunti, that a governed mind shall sometime feel the sense-storm sweep and wrest strong self-control by the roots. Let him regain his kingdom. Let him conquer this, and sit on me intent. That man alone is wise who keeps the mastery of himself. If one ponders on objects of the sense, there springs attraction. From attraction grows desire. Desire flames to fierce passion, passion breeds recklessness. Then the memory, all betrayed, lets noble purpose go and saps the mind till purpose, mind, and man are all undone. But if one deals with objects of the sense, not loving and not hating, 
making them serve his free soul, which rests serenely, Lord, lo, such a man comes to tranquillity, and out of that tranquillity shall rise the end and healing of his earthly pains, since the will governed sets the soul at peace. The soul of the ungoverned is not his, nor hath he knowledge of himself, which lacked, how grows serenity, and wanting that, whence shall he hope for happiness? The mind that gives itself to follow shows of sense, seeth its helm of wisdom rent away, and like a ship in waves of whirlwind, drives to wreck and death. Only with him, great prince, whose sense are not swayed by things of sense, only with him who holds his mastery shows wisdom perfect. What is midnight gloom to unenlightened souls shines wakeful day, is known for night, thick night of ignorance to his true-seeing eyes. Such is the saint. And like the ocean, day by day receiving floods from all lands, which never overflows, its boundary line not leaping and not leaving, fed by the rivers but unswelled by those. So is the perfect one. To his soul's ocean the world of sense pours streams of witchery. They leave him as they find, without commotion, taking their tribute, but remaining sea. Yea, whoso, shaking off the yoke of flesh, lives lord, not servant, of his lusts, set free from pride, from passion, from the sin of self, toucheth tranquillity. O Pritha's son, that is the state of Brahm. There rests no dread when that last step is reached. Live where he will, die when he may, such passeth from all plaining to blessed nirvana, with the gods attaining. End of chapter 2